Christians exalt a murderous theologian. Would you follow the teaching of a Christian theologian who had over 200 people brutally tortured and burned alive? Yes, this theologian, who has been deemed as a Christian, burned his detractors alive at the stake, the slowest and most painful way to die. With the zeal of an egomaniac, he declared himself to be dictator over his created religious police state in Geneva, Switzerland. Those who did not conform with his brand of theology were tortured and executed. Today, this person is celebrated within Christendom as a great theologian. His theology is taught in seminaries, and many believe his doctrine. What is overlooked, however, is that much of this theologian's doctrine was extracted from the writings of a church bishop instead of the authority of Scripture. It was the apostles of Jesus whose teaching inspired the New Testament, the commandments of God. It was the apostles who were friends of Jesus and who were given the power of the Holy Spirit to perform miracles to verify their authority. But no, this theologian preferred to refer to the authority of Augustine of Hippo, a mere church bishop, as the voice of authority. In Augustine's day, which was over 400 years after Christ, the townspeople were desperate for some form of Christian leadership, so they demanded that Augustine become their local bishop, which he did, reluctantly. Augustine determined that it was okay to use violence to enforce his brand of Christianity. Consequently, the theologian we are examining uttered the phrase, under the authority of Augustine, to give him the license to brutally torture and murder his religious opponents. We are discussing John Calvin, of course, whose teaching, as you know, is called Calvinism, Neo-Calvinism, or Reformed Calvinism. The most extreme today is called Hyper-Calvinism. John Calvin taught that before time even began, God had already chosen who gets into heaven and who gets the eternal torture of hell. You had no choice in the matter. God has already decided your fate before you were even born. In other words, your free will and decisions have nothing to do with your eternal destiny. The choice was already made for you by God. According to Calvinism, this means that God purposely creates most of humanity to suffer in the despair of hell, regardless of what they do. They have no choice of their own. However, if you are one of the lucky ones, one of the save who God mapped out before time began, it doesn't matter what you do, you'll be saved regardless because God chose you. You cannot lose your salvation. This, of course, is known as egomania. The belief in special status, a belief that the person has some level of divine importance to God. Is it any wonder, then, that John Calvin's egotism would drive him to rule over others as a dictator? Today he would be labeled as a type of Hitler, a ruthless tyrant that had no problem executing others who opposed him. Calvin actually praised God for orchestrating the torture of heretics. Considering his police state, torture and murder, does John Calvin appear as a genuine man of God or a disciple of Jesus? Jesus stated firmly that you will know them by their fruit, as we read in 1 John chapter 3, verse 15. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. One of the Lord's Ten Commandments is not to murder. Jesus stated to love your enemies, not to torture and kill them. It's obvious that Calvin's theology will lead to some form of egotism, the belief that the person is God's special delight and is more worthy than others. Beware that Scripture clearly teaches that egotism is something that God despises. It's repulsive to him. Since Calvinism is taught as truth and many follow his teaching, one needs to ask if there is any authentic proof that this theology is actually true. Before examining how Calvinists misread Scripture, we need to state the obvious as we read in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 8 and 9. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. In the Old Testament, in the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 6, we read, For I am the Lord, and I do not change. All the people in the Old Testament times were instructed to repent and to sacrifice for their sins. Even the temple priests were to atone for their sins. Nobody was exempt. All the people had a choice in the matter, to do the atonement required or not. And, as clearly laid out in Scripture, eventually the Israelites disobeyed God and were punished severely for it. How can someone repent if they do not have the free will to do so? If one believes he or she is already saved for God regardless of what they do, then there's no need to repent. In other words, the concept of repentance is essentially meaningless to Calvinists because they're already saved. So why did Jesus state to repent which is the act of the will to change one's mind, as we read in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17? From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. To repent means that one changes the mind about their behavior and attitude, and this is most definitely a sign of free will. Is it any wonder, then, why Calvin never preached about the necessity of being born again? To be born again involves making the decision to do so. We read in John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The greatest commandment is to love your Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, which is an act of free will. The very core of love involves the free will to choose to love. It cannot be forced or automated. This is why even Satan, as well as the Lord's angels, could choose the path of rebellion over the Lord's directive. They had the free will to choose their revolt. Okay, let's now look at the specifics of how Calvin convinced so many to believe him. The core of the Calvinist theology is the concept of predestination. Calvin's famous definition of predestination is as follows. We call predestination God's eternal decree, by which he determined with himself what he willed to become of each person. For not all are created in equal condition. Rather, eternal life is foreordained for some, and eternal damnation for others. The idea of predestination is the bone that most people choke on. Curiously, predestination isn't particularly a Calvinist idea. Augustine of Hippo taught it centuries earlier, and Luther believed it, as did most of the other reformers. Yet Calvin stated it so forcefully that the teaching is forever identified with him. By his own admission, John Calvin's theology was deeply influenced by Augustine of Hippo, the 4th century Catholic Church father. As mentioned earlier, instead of following the teachings of the Apostles, Calvin believed that Augustine of Hippo most accurately represented the teachings of the early Church. So, Calvin's constantly repeated theme was this, you cannot manipulate God or put him in your debt. If you are saved, it's his doing, not your own. The Calvinist proof text is found in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. See, says the Calvinist, the Lord has already determined who shall be saved. This is generally the reaction whenever a Calvinist is challenged on the concept of predestination. On a superficial level, this may appear to be quite convincing, but let's look at this scripture at a deeper level, starting with the key word that is translated as for new. It's true, of course, that God knows everything. He knows the beginning and the end and everything in between. Since the Lord exists outside of time, he certainly knows who will respond to him and who will reject him. 
But to read into that passage that God chooses some for salvation and others for eternal damnation is irresponsible and heretical. And here's why. The Calvinist teaching that God chooses some for hell contradicts the words of Jesus as we read in Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 3. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. This verse and many others clearly demonstrate that they have the choice to repent. If the Calvinist concept of a fixed salvation is true, then why would Jesus instruct these that they should repent or perish? This would make Jesus a liar. The idea that people have no free will is proven to be preposterous in many accounts in the Old Testament, such as we find in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked should turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? In the very beginning of humanity, the Lord gave Adam and Eve instructions not to eat from the tree of knowledge. If they had no choice, why then did they decide to disobey? All throughout the Old Testament, the Israelites are admonished to forsake serving false gods and to serve and obey the Lord, as we read in Joshua chapter 24, verse 20. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done you good. Now, does this suggest that people don't have free will to make their own choices? Why then would the Lord make some people just to harm them? Remember, according to Calvinism, God did not give them the free will to choose to serve him rather than idols. Further, we read in Joshua chapter 22, verse 5, Only be very careful to observe the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and keep his commandments and hold fast to him and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Can the Calvinist answer why the Lord would give his people such a directive to obey his commandments and to love him if they had no free will to do so? One constant theme throughout the Old Testament is how the Israelites constantly strayed from serving the Lord, choosing instead to worship idols. When the consequences of their idolatry would become unbearable, the people would finally come to their senses and repent, as we see in Judges chapter 10, verse 10. Then the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against you, for indeed we have forsaken our God and served the balls. We ask again, how can repentance occur in the absence of free will? God has also given us the ability to reason, which is a process of choice. The Lord actually invites us to reason together with him, as we see in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. The capacity to reason, which is the act of thinking about ideas and expressions of thoughts, is only possible with the freedom of choice. Scripture is abundantly clear that the Lord has offered the gift of salvation to everyone. However, he will never force anyone to surrender to him or even to rebel against him. We truly have free will to decide our eternal fate. So how can a Calvinist reconcile the error of predestination when we read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires that all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. How, too, can anyone believe that God has created some for the purpose of eternal damnation when it's so obvious that it is not his will, as we read in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9? The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. If God has already predestined certain people for salvation and the rest to eternal hell, why then should Christians even bother to evangelize? That is one important question to ask a Calvinist. If a person's fate is already sealed, 
Nothing we can do can change that. Doesn't Calvinism refute the Great Commission? Why would we be told to tell the world about the good news if God has already decided who is saved and who is not? It seems cynical to do so, knowing that God has already pre-approved who goes where. The Calvinist, of course, is on the safe side and is part of an exclusive elect. If we were to believe Calvinism, we would have to conclude that God has made us automatons, people who do not have the will of their own to obey God or to rebel against him. Such absurdity should be evident to everyone. In order to actually love someone, there has to be free will or it isn't love. The Lord's angels had the choice to rebel, which many of them did with Satan. The Lord wants a people for himself to willingly surrender their own will and submission to his just and perfect will. A dear friend of mine once said that the Lord is the ultimate gentleman. This is so beautifully stated as we read in Revelation chapter 3 verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. There are many resources available that refute the concept of Calvinism. If a Christian teaches Calvinism, this should be a red flag warning that they are teaching false theology. If they can be wrong about this, then what else are they wrong about? It's clear that many Calvinists are not walking with the Holy Spirit as commanded in Scripture, otherwise they would not teach such error. In fact, many Calvinists are also cessationists, believing that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are not available today. Jesus did not do many miracles in his hometown because of the lack of belief. The fundamental core of Calvinism is lack of belief, especially the belief in Scripture and the power of the Holy Spirit. Many Calvinists are actually closet egotists, proving that they really are not the people of God that they believe they are. Regardless of how well known the Calvinist is, and regardless of how much truth they teach, they have proven that they cannot be trusted because they're teaching this false theology. So beware of them, folks. We hope this video has been helpful, and please check out the links in the description area for more information. Thank you so much for listening, and may God bless you.